put it on the chat or something rather than just disappear. I mean, you know, it can be a network thing or it can be whatever. Um, yes, just let me know. That's that's it. That's all I'm asking. Yes, ma'am. Uh, so, Michael, go. Uh, we're just gonna we're not gonna start before Buddhism, but we'll start with Buddhism and. Um, is there anyone besides Michael that wasn't there for the first day of Buddhism? If so, you speak after Michael. Um, we started out with comparing uh, Buddha. Buddha and the Hindu Brahmins are like Jesus and the Pharisees and Sadducees, the establishment, Socrates and the Athenians who had authority and they all, you know, they stood up to him, blah, blah. Then the doctrine, life is suffering. So this is when people accuse religions of being pie in the sky, wait a sec, <laughs> some are, some aren't, right? Uh, Buddha is very realistic. Um, start out with the assumption life is suffering and then uh, work from there rather than, you know, uh, escape to another world or escape to God'll fix it or nothing. It's just dealing with suffering. Then the Eightfold Path Right Association would be Aristotle's friendships, Jesus' disciples, Confucius' followers, right intent, what do you really want, Aristotle's view of flourishing, um, right speech. That was that was very important for all of them is the power of manipulative speech, the importance of sim simple speech that gets right at the, the object of your thought so that people know what you're talking about. Uh, right conduct is obviously, it's a way of life. Right livelihood matters, right effort, uh, right mindfulness and concentration. Um, the idea that things are transitory um, and the uh, moral cause and effect, right? That's really important. Karma, you want to create good karma. Um, characteristics, he's very empirical. All of the things that he recommends have been confirmed through science. So he tested it a lot, egalitarian. There's the contemplative branch and then the active returning to the world. And then Zen Buddhism, I will talk about a little bit when I go over the artwork. Then I compared Buddha and Jesus, um, their life stories, and then the rest is about the slides. So, uh, Michael, did you have some comment on that particular day? Yeah, so I think I was here for the first, like, we just briefly um, mentioned uh, on Tuesday afternoon, we just briefly uh, talked about that. Um, and I had mentioned um, one of the things that I talked about was how, uh, if I'm not getting confused, no, I'm not getting confused, uh, is that um, he was, uh, he kind of like lived, the, I, I talked about how he had lived this like more lavish uh, early upbringing. Um, and then we had got, kind of gotten into a little bit about how, you know, he gave it all up and that kind of thing. Um, and then, um, and then the other, this was more of a question just so I could make sure that I understood, um, the, what I was reading and whatnot. Um, but they don't have like it, they don't, Buddhism does not, um, have like a true, like God figure. Doesn't have a personified being, right. separate right. being. Definitely does not have a being that created the universe that is other than the universe and that can intervene in human history, right? Right. There's no, that is not part of the religion. It's all energy, right? Right, and and then like, so I mean, the I guess not the goal, kind of the goal, but it's like it, it, it refers to like enlightenment a lot, right? Mm -hmm. um, so like comparably, what would you, what would you, like how would you compare that to like Christianity, for example? Well, it's uh, when, so you have to get in touch with the jiva. So Jesus did say, you know, the kingdom of God is within you. 
Um, and he wanted you to get in touch with your heart, right? He wanted purity of heart. So that's where I would say the comparison is. The kingdom of God is within you. You have to purify your heart. Um, and then, you know, some people will emphasize that purity of heart and virtue and a way of life. And Jesus says, not everyone who says, Lord, Lord, but he who does the will of the Father, right? So, you know, reciting doctrines is not worth anything. Uh, you can be a hypocrite. You can know, you can memorize the holy books and apply them like Euthyphro did, but, but that's corrupt. That's not the spirit of the law versus the letter of the law. So I would, I mean, most people would notice how different they are. I would, I would, I always focus on what's similar because people can so easily deceive themselves and each other, it, you know, if they want to cheat, <laughs> if they want to, you know, well, I have a relation to God, so I can hate Muslims or I have, so I can do this, you know, and I just, uh, I'm a philosopher. <laughs> if, if you can't give it also a rational account of why, you know, you think you're really in touch with a jiva, uh, you aren't. <laughs> you might be grifting yourself. Okay, so anybody else want to talk about anything on that day? Like with Kesney, I think. Yeah, go ahead, Michael. I, guess I just had one more uh, like note that I was, uh, and it was like his, uh, his idea that, of uh, like the, um, what was it called? Not the meme, he called it like the middle. The middle way, yeah. yeah. Yes, and uh, how that's, you know, that's been a reoccurring theme with some other, in some other, um, with um, Aristotle. 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 Yes. Uh, Confucius. Right. Really, they're all very yeah. similar. Jesus yeah. did change water to wine. He was not obsessively anti-alcohol. Right. Um, the, the picture you get of these people is they enjoy life and they're not judgmental, right? So you can have a lot of high standards. You're not self-righteous. You're not, you know, ha, look how righteous I am. And you're not judgmental because you have integrity. Like, why would you be judgmental? Because you basically think people who are conflicted are miserable. So why would you be self-righteous, right? Um, all right, Lakesney, you have any comments on that? Anybody else comments on that? Because we're behind. No. Okay. So next day is the second day on Buddhism. We had Buddhism and women, Buddhism and the environment, Buddhism and proverbs. I have paper topics. Um, you can pick from any of those if you want to for your third paper. I have topics on everything all over the place, right? Okay. Um, and then I had seeking Christian interiority. So those were the ones we talked about last time. Um, all right, so who wants to start there? I can go. Okay, Mary Hanna. Okay, so um, on the wisdom of Buddha one, that one. Uh, I had two quotes that stuck out to me. And one was, as rain breaks through an ill-thatched house, passion will break through an unreflecting mind. As rain does not break through a well-thatched house, pain will not, passion will not break through a well-reflecting mind. And I really like this one because it kind of made me think of like the foundation that you set your life on. And it makes me think like going back to, well, I learned like VBS as a kid, like build in your foundation on the rock you know and, that's the um, sermon on the mount you can find it on the sermon on the mount right and so um that's why i really like that one just because the better like your foundation is um in this case uh the more passion you have and then another one compared to aristotle i guess uh the virtuous man is happy in this world and he is happy in the next so I'm assuming that's the afterlife, like whatever afterlife you are. So like the more virtuous you are, um, 
the better you set yourself up for whatever you believe is an afterlife or how are you getting into it. Um, not going to go into everybody's beliefs, but. And then another outline that I liked was see the seeking Christian, um, that one. Mm -hmm. And um, whenever he asked the question, is religion something that may or may not be very important to humans or must it in some way in integrate all other aspects of existence? And he answered and said, I came to the conclusion that if it is some, if it isn't somehow everything, it's nothing. And that just made me feel like, the people that halfway believe in something um, because they don't really fully agree with something or fully don't know what they believe in. Um, he's basically saying, what I think he's basically saying is like, you can't just pick and choose. Like you need to be all into one thing. And I feel like maybe I'm reading that wrong, but that's never fully accurate because like Confucianism, how he read the, um, and kind of took what he believed was right and mixed it with something else. Like, I mean, I believe you do have the freedom to do that. Um, some things can seem a little insane at times. So that's another thing. And then another quote was, Christians are responsible for the culture in which they live, however unlike-minded it may be. Um, I don't know. This one just kind of made, like, I just kind of stopped at this and was, like, confused about it, if that makes sense. So I didn't know if y'all talked, like, how much you got into that. So I was just curious. Well, yeah, I think he, later on, he's, he comes up with something that's an inner faith thing, right? Mm -hmm. Right. So, but, you know, when you say it's everything, and most people think, oh, that means you have to have this doctrine, right? Mm -hmm. and, you have to, and, and that, I don't think he wants to say that, right? right. Well, I don't even think he knows what he's talking, what he's saying, right? Does that mm -hmm. make sense? He would. You know, if somebody called him on that and said, oh, does that mean Thomas Jefferson was really a bad guy because he was a Unitarian, so he didn't accept the Trinity? I mean, he'd say no, right? And mm -hmm. he'd, you know, our founders were concerned with Confucius values and they wanted virtue clubs and they wanted you to separate your political conscience from, you know, this, I, I, yeah, it's shocking to me that he really, this is a typical privileged white guy sitting in his office. He keeps projecting what he means, but the average person hearing him is not going to hear that. Does that make sense, Mary Hannah? Yes, ma'am. But when it was like Christians are responsible for the culture in which they live, I was like, isn't kind of everyone, like, not just Christians? Well, not only that, but I can just see all sorts of people freaking out and trying to convert everybody else and having all these power right. struggles, right? And that's not what... That's not at all what he thinks he's saying. Right. But he doesn't know what he's saying. Okay, you guys. When you see how a scholar can do that, you have to think to yourself, right? Have you ever had that where you thought you were saying something? Especially when it comes to morality. And somebody else interprets it exactly the opposite. And you're just like, how'd you get there? And then you realize you just have all these assumptions from your background. Does that make sense to you guys? I think in college is when you have to start waking up, right? And realizing that um, the associations you had with certain words, especially when it comes to religion, and, you know, for one big example, religion, oh, that's anti-social justice and, and that's anti-Black Lives Matter, right? Black Lives Matter is a corruption of Christianity, but the dang liberals, right? And somebody else says, no, no. So you do have to be really careful about what you mean when you refer to those words. And I don't think Mr. whatever his name is, Dupre was very being very careful. Okay, anybody else want to comment on that or step up and do your three comments? Those of you who were gone. I'll go next. Okay, Jason. Um, I, I did this, well, I took from the same reading, uh, The Wisdom of Buddha. One of the uh, quotes on there was, um, all that we are is the result of what we have thought. 
It is founded on our thoughts. It is made up of our thoughts. If a man speaks or acts with an evil thought, pain, pain follows him as the wheel follows the foot of the ox that draws the carriage. And then it went on to say the same thing. But like, if you know, if you think about like, um, <clears throat> if you if you think pure, you know, happiness and folly, I think that's a big thing for, uh, for everybody, especially now. It was like, um, in in um, you, you are where your thoughts. You know, like if if you're constantly thinking about like sad stuff, you know, you're you're always gonna be like sad. Or if you're constantly um, listening or or reading something or basically put um, putting yourself around things that don't necessarily bring you whatever it is that you want that's where you're going to get um kind of that kind of thing and then another quote was that um kind of plays into this as well as uh as a fletcher makes straight his arrow <clears throat> a wise man makes uh straight his trembling and unsteady thought which is difficult to guard difficult to hold back as a fish taken from his watery home and thrown it on the dry ground our thoughts trembles all over in order to escape the dominion of mara the temper um that's a big thing because like i think um for me i think um man my mind be racing uh, racing a million thoughts you know per minute and it's kind of hard to like you know stay focused and and not always like say what i, I want to say but you know just like just like having control over your mind it's, it's that type of thing i think so and uh your phones are not improving that right no. No. I mean, of course, I taught before students had phones. And I think, honestly, when they first started having phones, they were the least critical of it and the least able to distance from it. Does that make sense? But I think a lot of you have sort of learned, hopefully, how to control your phone and not let it control you. I hope so. Um, yeah, especially since it's designed to trigger fear. And then you can also use it to trigger pleasure and fantasies. But yeah, this would be the opposite, right? So that's why Buddhism has still really got a lot to offer because it's telling you, really, your brain is deteriorating. You really need to learn to focus. Uh, very good, Jason. Anything else? Jason? Um, no. That was the main one? I, 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 I think um, I kind of, I don't know, that was a little brief. I guess to, to kind of like go on more on to really the first quote, it's kind of like, um, it's what, um, like if you surround yourself, like in, you know, a certain environment, you know what they say, like if you surround yourself with winners, you're going to be a winner. Surround yourself with losers, you know, you're going to be, a, it's kind of that kind of thing. It's um, That's right, association. Right. Right. Um, it's, it's, I think it uh, speaks volumes to that kind of thing. So, um, you know, I want to say you are who, you know, who you hang around with, but like who you hang around with and what you decide to put yourself around, you know, kind of um, influences how you think and how you act. And so if, you know, you get, you're constantly around like things that are bringing you down, you're always going to be upset. You're always, you're always going to be expecting this, but never get that. It's also your own reaction. Like, you know, my kids went to inner city schools and some of those kids are going to be in deep trouble, right? But the thing about it was, it isn't who you're around. It's if you're attracted to that or not, right? So I wanted them to be in those schools so that they would play the role of somebody who understands, has a lot of empathy, Somebody who watches one of their peers get, you know, lives under much more difficult circumstances and some of them pull through and some of them, you know, fall off. And I, I just wanted them to be there so that eventually they could govern, right? There's all these different kinds with pros and cons. Um, so it really depends upon the, you know, the character you bring to the situation and then what you learn from the situation. Does that make sense, guys? Because parents were going out to the burbs. Oh, I don't want my kids to be around these future criminals. Like, well, you know, if it corrupts your kid, it might have something to do with your kid. Sorry. <laughs> 
you know, there are plenty of wonderful kids in those schools. And um, you know how parents always say, well, he got in with the wrong crowd. <laughs> like, uh, he is the wrong, I mean, you know, come on, you gotta, you gotta, uh, yeah. But if a child grows up where everybody, they don't know any alternative, that's different. Um, but okay, the other thing I wanted to say was, I hope you all realize that all these, these natural um, images and the, the thatched house and also the straight arrow and the fish flopping. So it makes for this phenomenal art, right? So I, if I have time, I'll show you that art. But did any of you look at, look at some of that art that I posted? Because it's such amazing art because it just, you know, it's triggering the spiritual, right? So everything visual is leading to the spiritual. Um, and then the last thing is um, that you should, again, realize that you are literally creating your life history. We are creatures of culture. And so you, at this point in college, you literally mold your character, you create a life history. And I don't know, I mean, I regret a lot certain things I did, I have to live with that, right? So I'm warning you, you do have to live with it, especially in the most difficult circumstances. Um, and, you know, it's better not to have regrets. It's better not to have given in to an extreme. Um, but a lot of ways to prevent that is to say, what do I want to have done in this situation, right? You, you see yourself forward. You see, I'm going to be in this really difficult situation. Look, how, how do I want to deal with it so that looking back, I can tell myself I did that, right? And the COVID is one of those things. Um, but you are literally creating your history. And that's what Aristotle means when he says we are creatures of culture. Culture is a second nature. It doesn't mean we're a blank slate. We have to deal with those same passions. But the wisdom literature teaches you, don't do this, do that, right? Gives you some guidance, but in the end, you choose it, right? And you are it. And then it, it makes it that much more difficult to get it right the next time. So uh, just a warning from a wise old lady who, didn't necessarily get it right. <laughs> you do have to live with it. It's not pleasant. Um, who's next? Caitlin, Caitlin, go ahead. Yeah, I was just about to say I can go ahead and go. Okay. Um, so the first one, I have two quotes from the Seeking Christian, that, that article. Um, the first one is, but to survive as human beings, we need some coherent meaning in our lives. And then the second one, they feel that the fragments of meaning present, present to us must somehow be united in a matter that modern culture is to accomplish. And so from those two quotes, I took um, the idea. So first I was thinking like, a lot, I feel like a lot of Christians in society have like a negative, like like look to them because like a lot of times they're like very hypocritical and like using the Bible for their own agenda and stuff like that. And I think that comes from people like going to Christianity for like a sense of belonging rather than like living for God's word. So I think that um, that causes a problem. And, you know, the second one was from the wisdom of Buddha and it was let the wise man guard his thoughts for they are difficult to perceive, perceive very artful and rush wherever they list thoughts well guarded bring happiness and i think that just continued to um discuss buddha's like idea of like controlling your mind and controlling your thoughts and like having power over your thoughts will like help you lead a better and virtuous life and you're able to really make decisions based on reason rather than like being anxious or just having negative thoughts that are useless. 
Na okay. Obra. Okay, so the need meaning, again, the old liberal arts uh, tradition was students getting exposed to a lot of people who found meaning in science or art or music or social science, you know, so they get exposed to a lot of alternatives. Plus they get uh, mentors, you know, coaches and advisors. Um, and, and the thing that really annoys me, so many intellectuals in the last 50 years, oh, people are seeking meaning. Well, that's just because they can't, you know, they really have given up on the big daddy in the sky. And if I'm nice to daddy, he's going to let me go to heaven. I mean, just because you don't have the daddy in the sky doesn't mean life isn't meaningful. So the fact that I had a little kid, right? I mean, you're going to, you're going to look at your kid and say, well, life is meaningless. No, as soon as you have a kid, it's like, everything's about them and their generation and you're living so that they can have a decent life, right? It's just, where are you guys sitting in your office? I don't get that. And I also don't get, we're destroying life on earth and you're saying life is meaningless? Like you find no meaning in trying to create a sustainable society? So Caitlin, does that make sense to you that it's just super bizarre? Yeah, it does make sense. But I think it goes back to that big daddy in the sky went away right and that comes from these religions of the book and i think actually i know for a fact uh muslims there are muslims that have the same problem and we'll talk about that when i was in indonesia um anybody else uh want to react to caitlin uh yeah i, I think um what she said about like um they used to, like guarding your thoughts. Uh, I can't remember the quote, but I think um, I think that's a big thing because like um, you know you don't got, not everybody has to know like you know what you're thinking or what you're about to do or you know what because uh, like sometimes like telling you know speaking on that or some people might not understand all of that, but like it might not bring you the peace that you probably thought you were gonna get from telling somebody or the right reaction or. Um, yeah, just like the um somebody's like reaction to what you're you know what you're thinking is probably not gonna be so like keeping that to yourselves I think is a big thing, and because like you know and a lot of people like, uh you know a lot of people are just looking to like, in you know drag somebody down so I, I think is that's a big thing to like guard your thoughts to keep it to yourself because not everybody has to know and that's okay and 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 it'll come to you whenever the right person for you to talk to about certain stuff or tell you know um what you think about this or what you think about that so that's you know the stereotype of asian people is they're passive aggressive right <laughs> they don't say right does everybody understand that but i think that's you know that's not necessarily true um guarding your thoughts is just not being impulsive and then trusting like jason said that eventually the truth will out or you'll figure out what the best way to deal with it is. So it's not passive aggressive. Passive aggressive is where I think I know that this person really needs to get it, you know, <laughs> get a put down, but I'm not going to do it because it's not appropriate. That That's passive aggressive. Um, and, I, and again, we go back to Gandhi, Jason, where he said, I can't understand why some people get pleasure out of humiliating somebody else right jason does that make sense yes ma'am it is yeah sure keep your mouth shut if that's what you think um all right michael um yeah so one of the things i wanted to point out well, somewhat went along with what caitlin was talking about um but there was a second uh there was a section in the seeking christian um interiority yes ma'am that one um on uh it was let's see um does christianity still have the capacity to renew and then it kind of talked about how um and chris uh sorry no goodness uh caitlin talked about how um a lot of like uh like christian and churches have really like um 
they well in my, in my mind uh people like churches had been alienating others um but then the section in this in this uh, in this reading it more talks about how the culture has a, our culture has actually been alienating you know uh the, the churches and christianity and i didn't really think about it in that capacity um but I think that that's kind of like an important um, distinction because I feel like uh, I feel like although churches, you know, they have been alienating other people, it's resulted in culture alienating churches, so to speak. Um, and so I thought that was an interesting, uh, interesting uh, bit on that one. Um, and then I had another um, uh, on the wisdom of Buddha reading. Um, it was. One second. Um, so it was. It's a large paragraph. I'm not going to read the whole thing. Um, but essentially, it, um, it was talking about like um, he. Let's see. He. Who, he he disappeared. Um. All right, so uh, Lakesni, did you have a, something to say? I'm going out of come now. Whoops, there's Michael. Just a sec, Lakesni. Go know. ahead, Michael. Anyway, he who pays homage to um, one, I'm sorry. He who pays homage to those who deserve homage and then da 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 da. Um, no, I'm going to have to read the whole thing because it doesn't make sense otherwise. Uh, but he who pays homage to those who deserve homage, whether the awakened or their disciples, those who have overcome the host of evils and crossed the flow of sorrow, he who pays homage to such as have found deliverance and know no fear, his merit can never be measured by anyone. Um, and I think that that, um, I feel like that just talks like, obviously, like it's referring to um, like more of a like um, not not like not respect to like a god or you know that kind of thing uh and i, I think that, that you know it, it, it references buddha for example um but i think that's just a general uh just like a general idea or virtue if you will um that like like we we as people uh like take and that's one of the things like um that um what am i trying to say here Sorry, I lost my train of thought. Actually, were you thinking that you you uh, recognize a valuable character when you interact with one? It kind of, yeah. In the because this was referencing more so like our our relationship with um you know not necessarily like a god per se because we've talked about how you know that that's not specifically what you know, that Buddha was not a god. Um, but somewhat, yes, that is what I was getting at, uh, was that this in general is just, a, it's just a, um, it, I don't know. Well, misunderstandings in relationships uh, is a huge problem, right? And um, the ability to deceive or to be deceived, that's a huge problem. And Buddha was perceptive about people and so was Socrates and so was Jesus. Um, and you really have to know yourself to even begin to understand other people because you have to know when you are like faking it, <laughs> right? Or when you have good intentions and make a mistake. I mean, it's really hard to know other people if you don't know yourself. And if you are deceived about yourself, you're going to be a sucker, right? <laughs> Does that make sense, Michael? Yes, ma'am. Um, what about other people? Anybody want to comment on that? Okay, Lakesni, go ahead. All right, the comment I got from Wisdom Board. Okay, so could you talk loudly and slowly? It's just hard. Rain break the uh quote I, I got a quote from Wisdom of Buddha. It 
to us as a base during ill at that house passion I felt was is like the house as as how you think like your brain and like brain as any negativity they can pour into your brain and poison it which um Jason Jason had a couple good points on his quote and I think one was like um front like who you have around which is like the nature of input and output like if you put like if you're constantly putting thinking of positivity and then it flip through your mind then you're a little happy or if you let negative people come to your life and pause their thoughts then you'll suffer or not live good at all and that's what i got from now on and am i supposed to keep going go ahead keep going that's great um, as I have for honor, I this from um, this one from seeking Christian interiority. Uh, what I thought was uh the topic of that one was atheism. Like I never thought like people were converting from like but not converting like going from Christianity or anything straight to um like just not believing in a figure or anything like that. I just thought like people just even like when they grew up like just born, just born not believing in anything. Like so um and I was I never paid attention to politics or anything or anything going around in other countries. So when people were opposing like religions in general, like that surprised me. Um a question I had, like I always thought to myself about it, and it was about atheism. Like, would you rather believe in a religion and end it and like when you die, you find out there's no God or anything that you believe in? Or would you rather not believe in anything and die and find out there is a God or deity? There is a famous mathematician, Mr. Pascal, <laughs> and he makes it like a deal, right? Okay, so if you bet there is a God, you know, then you end up, you know, with the advantage. And if you bet there's not, like, you don't gain anything. So overall, you know, just make it, it's called Pascal's wager. <laughs> I'm just like... <laughs> Does that mean you can act any way you want? I mean, that's the kind of really superficial, you know, that's totally superficial. It has nothing to do with virtues. Does that make sense, Lakesney? So a lot of people are atheists yes, because they no, a lot of people are atheists because they think religious people are corrupt. They have an ulterior motive. They don't do anything good for any, just because, just for its own sake. They, they It's always for the reward or the fear of punishment. And um, so I'm going to be an atheist, a secular humanist, and I'm going to have do all these virtues. I'm going to be more generous, more even-tempered. I'm going to be more determined to be virtuous, to pass on a better world to my children, and to just show myself and everybody else that human beings can do this for no other reason than that they care about other human beings. And if there is a God, he's certainly not gonna punish me for the way I lived. Does that make sense, you guys? I mean, I have many different kinds of students and I knew many different ones in college and there were ones like that, they're just absolutely determined to really be virtuous, but without any other motive at all. Okay, so Lakesney, is that okay? Does that make sense? Yes, ma. Okay, so that's going back to humanism. So you can think about in your final world view, right? In your final world view, Try to, you know, in, take account of all this stuff. Um, and I will, you must tell me that you learned something. 
I, I told the students, I can't necessarily teach you anything. And so I would get these final papers that, no, I didn't really change my mind, but, you know, it was interesting. I was like, sorry, you might not change your mind, but you expanded your mind, like your mind has changed. I'm sorry, if you, I'm t I don't want to read papers like that. Uh, <laughs> let's see. Um, all right, so let's look at some pretty pictures. Is that okay, guys? Just for a few minutes. So the wisdom of the Buddha, this is such beautiful poetry when it goes with the art. So this is about, um, anyway, that's about treating people. Here's the ill-thatched house. Um, let's see, Ugh, let, me, let me do this so I can see stuff. Um, all right, so here's, uh, people can recite a large portion of the law, but not do it. That's Jesus, right? He said, I have not come to destroy the law, but to fulfill it because it's about a way of life. And so this is all about the letter of the law versus the spirit of the law. And that's true. The Brahmins, you know, knew the letter of the law, but not the spirit of the law. The Sadducees and Pharisees, the Athenians that Socrates ran up against. And also we're going to Muhammad. Same thing with Muhammad. Um, okay, by rousing himself, the wise man makes for himself an island. Okay, so you think we might see a picture of a man standing on an island? And then you're supposed to think, right? This is just a visual image of something that's actually spiritual, psychological. Then there's the terraced heights of wisdom. So you're going to see some pictures with terraced heights, and you're going to see some pictures. Uh, he is like one who stands on a mountain looking down on everything else. Well, you're going to see some pictures of that. And that's the, I just, I must say, I love this art because I love that wonderful sort of the physical and the spiritual going together. Because again, ever since high school, this notion of sustainability. And so art like that, really puts you in a mindset where you don't want to destroy the natural world. Like you get spiritual nourishment from going out into the natural world, from the art around you, and from just thinking about, you know, spiritually. It's like being on the top of a mountain, right? And so definitely it, it gets you attached to the natural world in a very spiritual way um okay the maya is a temptress like the devil right um okay takes okay all right so the four holy truths the origin of pain you know life is suffering that's important um examine yourself ah that should sound familiar um Let's see, the other shore. Okay, here's another big image is that there's a river and then there's a, uh, either a boatman going across or a bridge. This is huge because Buddha was called the boatman. And so on one shore is the world of Maya and illusion. And then in meditation, you go to the other shore. So uh, a lot of the pictures we see will have that. He who meditates alone in the forest. So a sensual pleasure like water on a lotus leaf, like a mustard seed. Jesus had a lot of images like this too. And I loved those as a kid. You know, the, the man who plants the seed and some of it falls on the rock and some of it falls on the, in, the, in the fertile soil. I don't, I'm just a sucker. I really love that stuff. Here's reaching the other shore. Um, all right. So then I'll show you some of these pictures. Um, okay. I hope you can see them. Can you see them? Can you see them guys? Yes. Yes, ma'am. Okay, good. So this one is I just wanted to talk about 
how, um, maybe I'll do it this way. I don't know, is it bigger that way or not? It's smaller. Smaller, oh, how'd that happen? All right, so anyway, okay, so think about what Buddha, he says that, you know, he's trying to get you to get this picture of there's this whole universe of energy. And so look at the look at this, think about it for a minute. First of all, it's black and white. So it's not drawing attention to your visual sense, right? It's, but it's, it's going from your senses, your vision to the spirit. And then it's layer after layer after layer is an image of your own psyche, right? Because your own psyche has layer after layer after layer. And you're trying to get down into that Atman, right? then it doesn't have a specific focal point because the Atman is an object of meditation, but it's not like a focal point because focal points are definitely related to our, our eyes looking at the world. So all of those things, truly the artist has in mind and the whole tradition evolved um, as a, you know, based on this view of reality. And it, it works like if I hope someday you can go to an art museum, and just stand in front of one of these for a while, like they're 30 feet tall, you know, and people come there and everybody's really quiet usually. So here's the thatched roof house and there's this, the water, right? There's always that going to the other shore. So you're on one shore and this thatched house is on the other shore. Here's another one with all this incredible depth, right? And there's the thatched house. And down here is the man on the island. And there's, uh, there's a bridge, right? So you're going to the other shore and there's the island and blah, blah. Here's the mountain. This is another characteristic of Buddhist art. It's minimalist, right? So it's really some, some brush strokes. But you know what it is. There's enough there for you to get oriented, but it's definitely teaching you how to look at the Buddha nature of the mountain, right? The spiritual nature of the mountain and the trees. Again, you can, these are there, and there's that wonderful house there. <laughs> um, and here is, um, yeah, this is another one with the, the island. And then the little bridge across the water. Here's the one with the waterfall. And there's the guy standing there. Um, this one is interesting because there's the man, right? And he looks just like the stone. And then he's holding a stick. And that looks just like the tree. <laughs> and he's looking at the mountain. Um, there's another one where the man looks like the stones. And he has a stick that looks like that. Um, and these are birds that, and they got cut off. Sorry about that. Yeah, they got his head cut off. Um, but there are pictures, yeah, there's a picture of animals, but it's the Buddha nature of the animal, right? And there's these wonderful mice. I love those Buddha mice. Um, and there's the lotus. So there's lots of stories of the lotus. Uh, Buddha's first sermon was a lotus sermon. Um, do you remember that he held out a lotus flower? He just held it out there. And finally, this very poor man got it, right? Which it is, you know, Buddha is just very, you know, uh, without talking, without dissertating, without anything, seeing if you get it, that you just look at everything differently. You make that transition to the other side of the water, right? And you see it spiritually. Here's a Zen Buddhist garden. And I hope you can go to one of them someday because they look exactly like these paintings, all these layers and layers of tree and greenery. And there's another one from high up and the stones. Okay, and then the tea ceremony is another ritual that's very, you know, slow motion to get you to meditate. 
Um, oh, I guess that's enough. So that's the idea. And then if you wanted to write any more about that, um, what I have here at the end, right, is I have um, the Zen Buddhist art and um, how you could think about how all these the color, the design, the space, the focal point, all this stuff reflects the view of reality, right? The view of no soul, <coughs> the four noble truths, the goal is nirvana. So when you sit and meditate on those pictures, you can completely lose yourself, right? And get liberated from your ego. Um, and then Zen Buddhism is you break the language barrier. So the idea is um, that you're actually doing the same things, but you're doing, it, doing them in a, in a completely different way. And you're in harmony, right, with, with the karma. So there's the list of it. Um, so that, that's that section. Uh, my mother taught art history, so <laughs> so, <coughs> uh, so I was kind of a sucker for that stuff. Um, let's see, we have a little more than a half an hour. Okay, so now we're going to do um, start with Islam. And first of all, I want to go back to the same outline where the question, when we did it with Hinduism, right? The Hindus, um, they don't care how you think about creation. They have a number of different stories. You can make up your own story. It doesn't really matter. What really matters is that there's all this energy and it emerged and it continues and it can be positive or negative and you can be a part of it. And obviously Buddhism is the same, right? You want to be in harmony with the jiva, with the great spirit, with the energy of the universe. Um, so, but both Islam and Christianity and Judaism have this separate God who created the heavens and the earth, right? And my point here is that it's problematic what that means. And scholars have disagreed. And, um, you know, God is the cause of the Big Bang. God is the sustainer of the universe. God is becoming, um, as the universe becomes more complex, God also become changes, okay? Um, the human relationship to God, and that's where you can, some Muslims are the same as some Christians, you know? Oh, well, God can come in and change it. Um, so when I teach the students in Southeast Asia and Afghanistan, they say that there are people in their countries who think they don't have to do anything about climate change because God will fix it or else he'll take us. You know, he wants it to end. Um, whereas, I, you know, Hindus and Buddhists, they might. So. Um, for example, the Myanmar is a Buddhist country and they have a lot of environmental problems and Nepal is a, is a Hindu country, but it's, they can't refer to their religion. <laughs> they just have to make deals to create jobs and things like that, but they don't, they don't use their religion to justify this stuff. Um, all right, so these are, we already went through a lot of that. But what I want to show you is that within Islam, it's been problematic. So um, I'm not, again, I'm not going to go over all this stuff. But Islamic cosmology, which cosmology is the theory of belief about the origin of things. And so, um, so Islamic intellectuals, have developed many different points of view. Some of them were actually uh, Greco-Hellenistic, uh, consistent with Aristotle. Some of them are not. Um, all right, so that's all I wanted 
to point out to you is that uh, if you read the newspaper, you would think that Christianity is totally different than Islam. These people are, you know, demonizing each other. And that is really not true. <laughs> um, then I wanted to remind you of the fact that the Bhagavad Gita is about a conversion experience turning around. Arjuna, we didn't have time to go get into it. But Jesus got baptized, turned around, you know, had this calling and he started his ministry. Um, Socrates actually describes something where it was for him, it was science. And he started out really wanting to know the causes of things. And he kept using physical causes. And then he changed his mind and decided there needed to be this bigger picture uh, cause. And he had, he came up with a conclusion a lot like Aristotle. So Aristotle's God is um, just the whole is greater than the sum of the parts. It's nothing um, mystical or personal or whatever. It, it just says that there is a force that holds things together as a whole. And also that the universe, it isn't it doesn't exist randomly. And also it moves in a direction toward more complexity. So that's just the ordering force, the fact that there is a force over and beyond each individual thing. That's what God is for him. But um, so Arjuna had this conversion experience uh, where he got in touch with the universe and Vishnu came in the form of Krishna so that's, you know, Jesus was God. It's similar to that. Um, okay. And the reason I bring that up is because that is a super big deal for uh, Muhammad. So I am, I'm just going to remind you that we're going to go over this. And then I'm going to ask each of you what your three comments were. So um, be prepared. I'm not going to just sit here and talk. Uh, some days you must wonder. Anyway, the two religions are so closely linked. They have the same founder, Abraham. Well, Adam, right up to Abraham. And then Abraham had two different, well, impregnated two different women. They had two different children. And that led to these two different uh, branches. Um, so Muhammad, the seal of the prophets, um, he was born into a corruption, corrupt situation. And um, we'll, we can, we'll just get into that more later. I just, um, we're gonna go up to here for now. And then for next time, we'll start with the Quran. Okay, so guys, what were your three comments? Does anybody want to start? I can start. Okay. So this is like the reading, right? In the book. Yeah, the Islam. Yep. Um, I could probably say a lot of things because there are a few things that stuck out to me. But um, just comparing like Muhammad to Jesus, like um, how God like sent his son um, you know, and then how Muhammad said God like called on him to be like the living truth and things like that. So there were um, a few quotes. To I guess I would say God sent the a angel Gabriel to. to right. Yeah. Okay. Right. Um, one thing that I kind of thought was funny in comparison in comparison to the other reading that we did was like how Justice owes men that one it was saying for if anyone understands a man's true character it is his wife so like <laughs> finally we have a reading that gives women a little bit of credit but um <laughs> yeah. I, could, I have like so many on different ones but um let me find the exact one well so mariana you can do three and then everybody else gets a chance but you come back we'll come back to okay. you um, one was 
just talking about tradition and it was saying that tradition depicts his administration as an ideal blend of justice and mercy. And I thought that was really interesting just because of everything that how, how we've talked about so far. And um, I thought that was really interesting. And then another one was that we see him as a master, not merely of the hearts of a handful of devotees, but of the collective life of a city, its judge in general, as well as its teacher. Um, yeah, I thought that was really interesting. What too. was it that Muhammad say that again? It says, we see him as the master, not merely of the heart of a handful of devotees, but of the collective life of a city, its judge in general, as well as its teacher. And I just think that like kind of goes into explaining like the importance of following also someone that's lived on the earth and not just the God. Um, and just like all in all, like because right, Muhammad at first was like not wanting that responsibility and he kept like saying no and no. And then finally, like, even his wife was like speaking sense into him and whatnot. And so that's why I thought it was um, really cool to point out where it said the task was not an easy one but in the end he succeeded in awakening in the citizens a spirit of cooperation unknown in the city's history so it's kind of cool like if you could like take that leap of faith like basically he had to do and um kind of throw away his old ways and just dive into this and then to see like what big of an impact it made and it even said as much like it's a mirror it was a miracle like the work that he did so just to compare it to like whatever whoever believes and even like the united states like someone to live like someone who is willing to um believe in something and just believe in a justice to where if you um take that task that's something that good and can even change history can come out of it for the better of everyone else but I could keep going, but I'm just gonna let everyone else go and I can say more later. Okay. So Michael, that's kind of like Confucius and how much impact he had over time, right? Okay, go ahead, Michael. Um, yeah, so first I just wanted to, so like the main, not the main difference, but like the, the, the not, well, so really it comes down to whether it was Ishmael or uh, who was the other, the other son, you know, said Ishmael le led to, um, yeah right islam and um jacob wasn't it i'm not sure but regardless you know what i'm talking about isaac isaac isaac, Abraham, yeah. isaac jacob joseph yeah okay yeah. um and so i guess one of my like is so is that agreed upon like that's that's an agreed upon fact from both sides okay so but then do you get what at what point do i mean do you have people who do you have people who, um, who, I don't know. I don't know how, like, I don't know how that can be an agreed upon fact, but then you have these completely, not completely different. I mean, they're, they're very similar in some ways, um, but I don't understand how you can have these like two separate like religions when like, <laughs> I don't know. It's just, it kind of confused me. Cause I was like, wait a second. Why are we agreeing that, you know, we have this up here, but then like later I would like, I don't know. Yeah, well, Michael, that's what the outsiders will say, right? Why are you guys beating up on each other? I mean, you're the same dang thing as far as I'm concerned. <laughs> uh, yeah, Michael, that's right. You can understand then how an outsider would just. Well, I mean, are there people who, who are there people that believe both? simultaneously i mean i i don't know well the religions of the book they're all the sons of abraham right the jews right and um the thing that annoys me as a philosopher is for somebody to think i'm special because i'm a son of abraham or i convert it you know you know philosopher says eh, you're not special because you're, you know, a descendant of Abraham or you belong in a religion that is. People are people. That's the philosopher in me, right? We're all made of the same clay. We all have clay feet. Sorry. <laughs> but 
that that's true. Um, why don't we try Akaya? I keep for Akaya. Somehow she always gets pushed. One more. Oh yeah. Okay. Go ahead. Sorry. Sorry. No. Yeah. That was just. I was just trying to under, make sure I understood. Kind of. Anyway. Um, but when they talk about um, how with um, Allah, 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 yeah, uh, they talk about how um, you know they you know obviously uh, with with Christianity uh, you have Jesus who is you know God's son, um, and then they talk about with Allah how like uh, Allah uh, yeah um, how you know they 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 don't you know he doesn't have a son because that takes away from that that makes him too human they talk about how that makes him too human and then they kind of talk about how um people fear people kind of fear him i think it's more of a respectful fear not like a not like a you know a, a super fear uh but i thought that that was like a, a significant uh difference but a, but an interesting one at that um just because you know i feel like where we think of compassion they think I say, I say we and they, but that's not what I mean. Uh, we're with, with, yeah, uh, we think of compassion. They think of uh, uh, more like a stern, if that, if that makes sense. Well, let's see. There's well, how many quotes? 73 where God is merciful and uh, 20 or no, less than that. No, 173 merciful and 25 you know, angry or judgmental or something, right? Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. That I, I don't know. I, and it, it does make sense to me that they think uh, Jesus was a prophet and he was a great person. I mean, no problem. It's just that saying God makes himself into a human being is to them, you know, God is God, you know, uh, not material. No um, and also there were other religions, Persian religion in that area, Mithraism, that that religion thought that God made himself into man, right? And the Hindus think that. And so, you know, just because the Muslims don't think that Jesus is God, they don't think, you know, these other things either. They just have a different view. And um, that would mean that Christians might have more in common with Hindus on this point, right? <laughs> okay, what else did you have, Michael? Um, those were the, those were the, the main, the main, yeah. Okay, Akaya. So, um, Michael and Mary Hannah brought up two of my points, which, well, Michael talked about, um, like, the religions and how they were, like, he was confused on the readings a little bit. I was, um, I was reading the, the passage, and then I went to the outline, and I was also a bit confused, because I'm like, they were, it seemed like they were, like, contradicting each other or something and then like when Mary Hannah talked about um the men's character and their wives and how um the women were finally getting recognition it just struck me because I know we've been talking about Buddhism and women and how like their environments are harsh and then um another one of my points I talked about Muhammad and his childhood and also him like his teachings and stuff like that and how he was born into like a corrupt society and then like even when he um started teaching he still faced backlash and stuff like that and so I compared that to like Socrates and Martin Luther King and Jesus and it it was a question that I was dwelling on like all day and it's just like why are these influential leaders allowing themselves to go through the extreme measures to fight for the greater good but then i answer my question because it's like it kind of I feel like it goes back to that what doesn't who makes you stronger and then also when you see the outcome of what they were fighting for it just it's like okay well this is why they went through it and this is why they were allowing themselves to uh be like spit on and threatened and stuff like that so and which side of history do you want to be on Akaya I want to be on the good side of history uh we're supposed to learn right we're supposed to learn 
So I, yes. yeah, I do think that you read the newspaper, we're doing, we're making all the same mistakes. Does that make sense to you, Akaya? I mean, it would be nice if in your worldview, you start showing analogies between a lot of this stuff and your own lives and all sorts of stuff. Anything else, Akaya? No, those were my main points. So. Trey, you want to go? Uh, yeah. Um, the first one I got is when they were talking about, so comparing like um, Muhammad and uh, uh, Jesus. So Jesus went through the, the cave, right? And then so did Muhammad. But they were both kind of having like experiences. Uh, well, Muhammad was kind of like having an experience. And so uh, it said, it said, um, then he released me and said again, proclaim. And again, I said, I am not the proclaimer. And again, he whelmed me in his embrace. And then he, they kept going through it or whatever. And then uh, Muhammad once again said that I'm not the proclaimer. But then it said, proclaiming the Lord uh, who created you. So basically, he was still trying to give him hope and what he was like trying to tell him what to do and, and tell him to keep on going forth with what he believes in pretty much. Um, I got, what else did I get? Can I just um, say, you know, the story of Moses, where God told him to leave the promised land, the people from Egypt. And he said, no, no, I'm not a good speaker. Like, take my brother. <laughs> right? So Muhammad's the same. Like, no, no, not me. Right? So go ahead, Trey. Uh, then I think the other one I got, I highlighted it somewhere. Good. Uh, so it says... Um, his early life was uh, cradled in tragedy where his father died a few days before he was born. His mother, uh, when he was six, and his grandfather who cared for him after his mother's death. So um, I don't really remember anything happening to Mary and Jesus like that, but that's definitely like something that um, I know that they were both kind of like struggling with, like definitely like tragedies they were going through and like going through, fight, fighting through pretty, pretty much. Um, but just like the tragedies that they had already had to go through and then were like continuing to go through and just to keep on speaking out, uh, putting forth what they believed in was just pretty strong. And then uh, the last one I got, it said, um, here we come to the first, uh, the grievance between the Kakurin and the biblical accounts according to uh, Quran, Ishmael went to the place where Mecca was to rise his descendants flourishing in, uh, I don't really know that word, but coming Muslims, whereas those of Isaac who remained in Palestine and Hebrews and became Jews. So basically what I got from that was basically like, they were just kind of like all really depending on themselves, like depending on each other to kind of like go forth through and then what they believe because I feel like, um, you know, as we had already talked about, like we don't, we, we can't really do things by ourselves. So, I guess it was just like the help from them kind of like got some help. So it's pretty sad that we're so, we have so much animosity now, right? Yeah. <laughs> okay. Um, the other thing I guess to point out is after Mohammed died, because it is um, a historical religion, it was a huge deal on who's going to take over the caliphate, who's going to, you know, like the Buddha, you know, there's a next incarnation of Buddha in, in Islam. And so there was um, his daughter's husband or his brother. They had this huge fight and they massacred each other. And that's the Sunni and the Shia. So within Islam, there's this horrible situation. So, you know, when we go and fiddle out over there in the Mideast, then, you know, they have a common enemy. But if we would just get out of there, their main enemies are between each other. So Iran is um, Shia and part of Iraq and Saudi Arabia is Sunni. Those are the main that's what they're obsessed with. <laughs> so it, that is just another 
crazy thing where these religions, because they're focused on a doctrine, they have all this animosity between them. Um, does that make sense to you, Trey? Yes, ma'am. Yeah, okay. Um, let's see. Um, Jason, you want to go? Um, I actually did not do the reading for this one. It was the one in the book. Right. Yeah. Um, yeah, I kind of don't have the book. I'm going to be honest. Jason. Well, I mean, I told you that's a flunk. You know, if you don't read the book, it's an F. Because um, the book is huge for the class. So, and it's not an expensive book, right? Um, so, yeah, you will have to tell me, you know, I, that's why, you know, it's when things like this happen that I say, okay, you are required on your posts to tell me that you read the book, right? And all that stuff. So you do need to get the book and you, because you can't pass this class without having read, you know, Hinduism, Buddhism, Confucianism, and Islam. It's a major part of the class. Um, Caitlin. Um, so I had also talked about kind of like the lineage, which I thought was like shocking because it was kind of like the same thing. Um, also, one thing that stuck out to me, uh, one quote that I wrote down, uh, Muhammad said, God has not sent me to work wonders. He has sent me to preach to you. Um, I thought it was interesting how he like never inflated his own image and he never like acted as if he was above anyone and he didn't pretend to do things that he couldn't do. So I just kind of liked that. Um, and then I don't even know where I wrote this down from, but I read, I don't even know if it was from the book, but it, I don't know. I don't even know. Permits a man to have up to four wives, but must love okay. and treat them equally. Okay. I wasn't sure where that came from, but, um, mm -hmm. I thought that was interesting and also the quote that Mary Hannah had said I wrote that down too so it was like the women were not equal I mean they wanted they were supposed to be equals from what they had said but like it was just weird well you know like, what you're gonna find when you read that justice men oh women chapter yeah. on Islam you can anticipate yeah. that you can also read the chapter on Christianity, you know, <laughs> uh, or you could just, you know, your own experience. Women are the cause of evil. Me, 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 me. Okay. Yeah. Jesus, I mean, over and over again, it's the same stuff. Um, anything else, Caitlin? Uh, that was all I had that hadn't been talked about yet. So, okay. So Mary Hannah, do you have some other things you want to say? Um, yes, ma'am, actually. Um, one of mine were, um, it was talking about the world into which Muhammad was born in, described by subsequent Muslims in a single word, ignorant. Life under the conditions of the um, desert had never been serene. People felt almost no obligation to anyone outside their tribes. So, like, assuming this meant they were just, like, very secluded into themselves. I was curious if like this like meant they weren't like welcoming to others. Um, I assumed not. So that just kind of made me think everything I've read, I just try to compare it to um sorry, I got a notification. My phone's on 20%. Um so it just makes me compare it to like today's issues. Um yeah. and it just made me think about how not just color of our skin how blacks and whites but also like everyone can probably relate to this but, like clicks and um I just like mean girls just came to my mind when I read that and I was just like you know they think it's like their road or the high road and that just stuck out to me and then I thought it was cool that mom had kind of overcame that and brought everyone together in a way I just thought that was really cool I flipped over that page that's why I didn't see it before but um I do. I have more. I wrote a lot down. So you can go ahead, though, Mary Hannah. Okay. Um, 
And then it said, yet despite his concern for others, he remained removed from them and outlook in ways, isolated in a corrupt and degenerate society. And just like basically like as he grew up and like learned so much more. Um, I thought that was really interesting. Um, because it's like he was he was scared at first obviously he did not want to be the one but then he kind of like gave into it and he was concerned for others but he had to like remove himself from that to like be able to see like what the world that was going on around him and I just think like that's kind of in response to the quote that I just said and so I feel like that was really important um and it all kind of had to do with him maturing and growing up. And I think that's like kind of where we are right now um, in college. And it's like that point in which we have to soon start realizing that it's like our time to step out of our comfort zone and learn and, you know, grow in ways that all the regions that we've read and spoke about. And um, yeah. Michael, go ahead. Okay. Um, so, like, with um, kind of like the idea of like, well, not the idea of actual life, um, but within um, like, within like, especially within Islam, um, it was more of like a, a, a judgment like after death, right? It wasn't. Uh, yeah, they have, they have the same as the Christian. Okay, so there's not a significant difference. Okay, okay. So it is, it's funny. And then these two religions tend to judge other people, even though their leaders don't, <laughs> right? And it's just sort of like, aren't you supposed to leave that judging up to God? I, I don't get it, right? I don't get it. Um, okay. Judge not that you not be judged, right? Uh, all right, guys, each of you has to work it out. Um, yeah, tribalism is a terrible problem in the Mideast, okay? There's a, you know, forever tradition of you belong to your tribe. And so the Jews are a tribe and the Muslims are a tribe and they don't get along, right? Um, but it got, obviously, there's a whole history there after World War II and all this stuff. Um, then the other thing was that all of you, by this time in your life, in high school and junior high, it's, some you did have to separate yourself from degenerate behavior, right? Or you wouldn't have made it into college. So, you know, I know all of you, that's occurred to you, right? To make a choice. I also think the, um, the kids that were raised under very authoritarian parents, maybe they behave themselves because they knew they get beaten or you know severe punishment. They come to college and oh my God, they just let loose. Nobody in this class knows anything about that, right? Uh, <laughs> Okay, so that's why Aristotle says if you're a good parent, the kids have internalized that. But college, coming to college is exposes if you had really internalized that behavior and you took pleasure in it, or if you resented it and now you're doing what you really want to do, but it exposes your character, right? What I really want to do is drinking and sexing, right? Uh, so I, I don't know. But the thing about lying is that people find out your character pretty quickly. <laughs> and um, then you've established yourself, right? And then it's hard to recreate. It's hard, you know, you can have regrets. It's a lot harder to pick up after you made some mistakes. But I hope, again, that lying students um, can recognize people who really do repent <laughs> and uh, try to change. And then the students that appear to, or, you know, I, I do think all of you learn a lot more about human character than I ever knew, especially when you have sports teams where you can see the behavior of the student on the team 
and then you know how they act on Friday and Saturday night. You know? So yeah, you guys, you learn so much about people that I did not know and I admire in my students. Um, let's see, anything else, Mary Hannah? Um, I, I do have one more thing, okay, then I'm done. Um, and so just the part where I was talking about how Muhammad was basically like ridiculed for um, like stepping out and then also his followers were, that led me to, I remember watching a movie and it was like the Amish um, people like still um, like even to like this day have like their own not I don't want to say tribe but like group and like the kids that want to like go and live a different path they're like kicked out of that and then comparing I remember like being in church and school and comparing it to like there are still countries that believe in their way and their way only and so I always just remember like teachers being like so be grateful that you live in a country that allows you to believe how you want without being abused basically but bullying beside mine but um I just think that's like a good reminder that the privilege that we have today plus in order to preserve it you have to be a good citizen right you inherited it but you can lose it that's what Plato we lost it in 30 years is what he's saying so every generation has to take that duty really seriously but it isn't a duty to strong arm other people into believing certain things, right? It's our founders, it's just to act virtuously. That's really important, including political virtues. So with that, I'll let you go. I do want you to, um, I think my assignment for next time, I did um, finally, I, I got, I, I mean, there was reasons why I didn't, um, get everything together until now, but there's definitely stuff about women next time. Uh, we're going to talk about the Quran next time. These articles from the New York Times, especially the last few articles, please read them. They're about uh, a school that required the students before they came to college to read a book about the Quran. And these fundamentalist religious groups tried to sue the school for religious brainwashing. So, and then there's reaction. So it's about you guys, it's about you. And then we have another one about, that one's about terrorism. The next day is about my experience in, in Indonesia, which has the most moderate Muslims in the world. The most Muslims that want to combine Islam with democracy. And then the last day, um, we have the union of reason and faith once more, and some physicists and some based on science, physics and stuff like that. Um, so that's it for today. Um, I will see you. Um, any other questions about process or anything? I do have one question. Okay. So we will have a paper this weekend, correct? Yeah, you don't have a paper this weekend. It was three we papers in the final, right? It okay. was three, three papers in the final. So now okay. some of you can get caught up. It's a to total of nine posts. So next week will be one post. Um, if you did want to wait until after Wednesday to do it, but of course you, all, you have a paper due on Thursday, so I wouldn't advise it. It's just that, why not, you know? Um, so that's it. Any other questions? Look back at the syllabus for the number of words count and sources. Um, I could put that up on another more recent post if you want to. Okay, take care. Bye-bye.